Welcome to the Institute for Public Knowledge. Um, I'm Eric Kleinenberg. I'm the director of the IPK. Uh, for those of you who are not um, frequent visitors here, uh, we are part of the university that tries to engage the city and the many communities we're embedded in uh, through a variety of projects. We do large-scale research projects that involve big teams of people. We have a lot of um, working groups where faculty and graduate students meet uh, to um, develop uh, scholarship in, in different areas, and we do a lot of pub public events where we try to um, create space, not just for people within the university, but for people outside the university as well. And one of our favorite things to do is um, book events, uh, w and when someone in our network has a book to launch, um, you know, we, 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 we love to, to produce debates here. Um, since I have you, I'll let you know that in the next several weeks we have lots of great people coming to the IPK. On Monday night, uh, Matt Desmond from Princeton is going to be speaking here in this room about his new book, uh, Poverty by America, which just opened as the number one best-selling book in the New York Times, which is the first time in my memory when a sociology book opened as the top-selling book in the world. So <laughs> let, us, let us all follow in his footsteps. Um, and uh, in coming weeks, we have Rogers Brubaker uh, uh, coming from UCLA to talk about his new book about hyperconnectivity and Esther uh, Hargatai coming from Hungary to talk about uh, digital inequality in COVID, um, and Meredith Broussard from NYU talking about uh, artificial intelligence and algorithms and race and inequality. So a lot of really terrific events. Um, if you're not on our mailing list, please sign up and come. Um, tonight, we're, we're really thrilled to have uh, two great thinkers uh, join us for a conversation about you know, one of the uh, really difficult, uh, contentious topics of the moment, which is what it means to be woke and where being woke falls in contemporary politics, whether it's uh, aiming towards something progressive uh, or whether it's doing the reverse. Um, it's no secret from the title of the book that Susan Neiman has just written that she has a strong view on this. It's, it's not a question. The book, I have the galleys here. Left is not woke is the title of the, um, the book tonight. And um, Susan is here to, to talk about the book. And, and we're really lucky to have Stephen Holmes from the law school in conversation with her. And um, we were kind of put this together on the fly when we found out we had a chance to, to bring her here tonight. Um, so. Uh, I didn't know exactly how this was going to run, but just in the last 24 hours, uh, we all agreed that what would really be best, since we have uh, Stephen and Susan both, is to just let them have a conversation about this. Um, so I'll give you a quick bio, bio on each of them, uh, and then I'm just going to let them run. The only thing that I uh, insisted upon uh, in my preliminary remarks is that at some point early on, Susan tells us what she means by woke, because any of you who are connected to the internet know that uh, another conservative author, a conservative author recently ha you know, wrote a book about the problems with woke and um, failed to define it quite famously uh, and, and wind up creating quite a spectacle. And uh, I don't want to have that kind of spectacle here tonight. And I also want us to know what we're talking about uh, when, we, when we explain what's wrong with this idea. And so I, uh, you, you will hear very early, I think, um, what this term means. Okay. Um, Susan is a philosopher, an author, and the director of the Einstein Forum in Germany. Uh, she's uh, written many books, including Slow Fire, The Unity of Reason, Moral Clarity, Why Grow Up, Subversive Thoughts for an Infantile Age, and Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil. Uh, Stephen Holmes is Walter Meyer Professor of Law at the NYU School of Law and a renowned scholar of the history of liberalism and illiberalism. Uh, his books include Benjamin Constant and the Making of Modern Liberalism, The Anatomy of Anti-Liberalism, Passions and Constraint, and The Matador's Cape, and he's the co-author of several books, most re recently The Beginning of Politics, Power in the Biblical Book of Samuel, and The Light That Failed, A Reckoning. Uh, we're really happy to have you both here tonight in conversation. Welcome to the IPK for you, Susan, and welcome back, Stephen. The runner show is, I'm just going to let them go for a while, and, and um, probably maybe 35, 40 minutes in, we'll open it up for questions, um, and you'll all get home before dark, perhaps. Okay, thanks very much. So we need to hold. <laughs> yeah, I think so. All right, so this does work. <clears throat> So, uh, Susan, I love this book. I learned a lot from it. It's a very gracefully written, but a, a combative book. It, ha it has an attitude. I don't 
don't know if that's cultural appropriation. Is that <laughs> it? Um, and I think because, well, I'm not really contradicting Eric or disobeying his instructions, but definitions can't be true or false. So people use these words, woke or the left, different ways, different groups use them. So I think one way to get at this is to distinguish your qualms about certain specific trends in the political culture and including the academic culture, which make you uneasy and make you feel that they are in some way a betrayal of an idea of justice that you think of as leftist or socialist. Um, so in the, uh, on the right wing, uh, or the MAGA uh, critique of the woke left, which I think is a phrase you probably wouldn't like to use. No, I don't. What, they, what their, uh, their idea, basic idea, which is obviously very different from the way you approach the subject, is that anti-racism is fundamentally anti-white. That is, they're, they're attacking anti-racism from their own particular point of view. And I think when DeSantis says Florida is where woke goes to die, it looks like what he means is Florida is where histories of slavery go to be burned and banned. So it could be something like that. So if you could use the distinction between the right-wing war on woke and your dissatisfaction with certain aspects of wokeness to explain to the audience a little bit how you use uh, the universalism, tribalism distinction, I think that's a, the best way to begin to explain how you're thinking about the woke phenomenon, broadly understood. That's a lot of questions at once. Thank you, Stephen. But um, let me start. Um, so first of all, I, my, the very first podcast that I did on this book uh, was before the poor woman went viral with her, you know, flubbing the definition. And I talked about why I think definitions are not much use in philosophy. I could quote Kant on that. Um, after that post went viral, I thought, okay, <laughs> I have to come up with something better. And I will, not, not to worry, Eric. Um, but let me start by saying what distinguishes me from the right to begin with. I say on the first page, I'm a socialist, okay? I'm actually not a Marxist. I'm a sort of Albert Einstein, Edward Bernsteinian socialist. That is a Kantian socialist, okay? Um, but um, I, you know, avoid the word liberal, um, perhaps because I do live in Europe, and the word liberal does not mean what it means here, um, but I certainly want to make a big tent with those of us who, um, you know, on any, who are, stand somewhere on the spectrum between um, liberal and socialist, okay? Um, Florida is where woke goes to die. You know, I think that what woke has come to mean on the right, besides a piece of sheer vituperation, is anything that's left at all, okay? And they thereby play on the uneasiness that many of us have with certain aspects of left. Um, I only use the can word cancel culture in the very beginning, uh, the first sentence of the book, to say that this book is not about cancel culture, because we've all talked about that enough. Um, my guess is that everyone in this room has, at several points in the last year, um, been in a conversation where people said, I guess I'm not left anymore because um, I'm not woke. And I mean, that was kind of what led me to write this book, which was to think, um, wait a sec, I'm still left. And there are features of them that are not left at all. Where it's confusing is that I think the woke are driven by progressive emotions that we all grew up with and, and share, okay? Um, empathy for marginalized people and indignation at oppression and a determination to right historical wrongs, okay? Where did they go wrong? They got, they went, they got the wrong theories. And the theories, you don't have to read Foucault or Schmidt to, you know, actually, um, you know, or you don't have to read them very seriously to be influenced by them. They've gotten into the water stream. Um, and I use lots of examples of that in the 
book of things that are just in the New York Times, okay? Um, sets of assumptions about what moves human beings to act. So I think the first quote I use is something that was said shortly after uh, Biden was elected. And it said, well, despite uh, Vice President Harris's Indian roots, the Biden administration may not prove to be so forgiving of the Modi government. And this is stuff that we all read. I mean, we're, we're all reading too much stuff, okay? Um, we're all trying to assimilate things. And uh, we don't stop to think, this is the this absolutely unstated but, uh, you know, a priori assumption that your political decisions are decided by your ethnic background. And so, first of all, there's that. And then secondly, um, if you're utterly ignorant about India, <laughs> you don't realize that the people who are the most outraged about what's going on in India in the last years are actually of Indian background. So it's more likely, frankly, that Kamala Harris would herself object to, to, uh, to Modi's government. But stuff like that goes by all the time. I also talk about, I mean, I talk about some specific theories, um, Foucault and Schmidt, which have reactionary tendencies and consequences which have wound up um, polluting, if you like, the general assumptions in the media that we sort of lap up every day. One more, just one more thing. I also talk about evolutionary psychology, which I think has played um, a hugely disturbing role. Okay, um, no, what are you gonna ask? a little bit more about the, the Kamala Harris example. That is, the, you, you, I think, you say in your preface that there was a project that you and Todd Gitlin were thinking about doing, and Todd, apparently, you quote him saying that, un, that the woke, what's wrong with woke is it says it's a, it's a good argument against another person that they don't belong to the same group you do. So there's this kind of group consciousness, the sense that um, being in a certain group is a criterion for having an authentic voice or having an inauthentic voice. So let me, let me uh, just push this in a slightly different direction. You uh, make a joke about positionality. And positionality means your position in the world determines what you're, you see and what you can say, what you're allowed to say. On the other hand, in the book itself, there are ways in which your position in life, living in Germany in particular, have influenced the way you see things. So there are two aspects of this, which I'd love to hear, and I think everyone would like to hear more of, one is the fact that in Germany, you see the possibility of a country holding together and flourishing even though it admits that it isn't innocent. That is, it can take its guilt and, and you wrote a whole book about the lessons for Germany uh, for Americans in dealing with the racist, its own racist, our own racist past. And second, you're a Jewish woman in Germany. And being a Jewish woman in Germany, you have come to be suspicious of the idea that uh, the vic victim groups have the more authentic or authoritative voice. And this has influenced the way you read post-colonial studies. So those are two, I think, very personal things mm -hmm. that can help people see where the book is coming from. Thank you. Um, yeah, the joke was uh, what used to be called ad, ad hominem is now called positionality. I, I mean, of course, um, we're influenced by, I mean, it's trivial to say that our own histories and particular backgrounds and geographies are, are um, influence us. But to say that they determine us is just simply false. But you're absolutely right. This book was very influenced um, by the political activity that has been taking up about 50% of my time for the past two years in Germany and a rethinking of claims that I made about historical reckoning in my last book, I still think it's true that Germany did something, you put it very nicely, did something historically unique in showing that it's possible to be a country, to have a historical narrative that um, centers even one's historical crimes as opposed to the normal historical narratives, and is actually a better off place than it was 40 years ago when I first came there. However, 
um, what's happened in the past couple of years is historical reckoning gone haywire. And there's been a reduction of, so it's like the Germans learned one thing really well. We were perpetrators. Who were our victims? The Jews. We're the perpetrators, they're the victims, and Jews can only be victims. And that has played out in an extremely devastating way um, in you know, a foreign policy that's somewhere to the right of APAC, um, where any criticism of the Israeli government is uh, you know, automatically anti-Semitic, there's a real, there's been a real McCarthyist move um, where people have been fired from their jobs. Jews have not been fired, although some of us have been called anti-Semitic in the major media. It's kind of funny when Germans start calling you anti-Semitic, um, but okay. Um, Muslims, on the other hand, have been fired from jobs and, um, and plenty of people are not getting grants, are not getting prizes and so on. So. I've been very involved in this in the past couple of years, thinking it was going to be easier than it turned out to be. And in the process of doing that and trying to um, explain to people that no, all Jewish voices were not victim voices, all Jewish voices are not talking about anti-Semitism, all Jewish voices, um, you know, Jews are complicated. I mean, right? <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, I, I realize where I'm sitting. I don't need to say this to anybody else. But believe it or not, it's a lesson that needs to be told to Germans. But I see a lot of parallels in the debates that we're having about race in the United States, and I see how people of color who refuse to take um, a particular position about centering race and centering racial trauma are not only called conservative when they're not, um, but they're kind of, you know, pushed out of the... Try saying the name John McWhorter in most universities and, you know, good progressive people, Thomas Chatterton Williams, and good progressive people, white people, by the way, <laughs> good progressive white people will you know, sort of move together. It reminds me very much of the ways in which Germans relate to Jews who, um, you know, say, no, no, actually that play was not anti-Semitic and it should have been, it should not have been canceled. Um, but these are, so, so it has left me rethinking the whole question of historical narrative, and I'm not at a place where I've stopped thinking yet, so I don't yet have an answer to how much historical reckoning should we do. I just have one absolute conviction on that score, which is that what's going on in this country, and to some degree what's going on in Germany, is not historical reckoning, it's racial reckoning. We have yet in this country to even think about the historical reckoning that we need to do about the, the suppression of the labor movements, uh, about this, you know, what happened during the Cold War. All of that uh, has been channeled as if there was only one problem in American history and it was racism again. Um, I grew up in the South, it would be idiotic for me to deny that racism has been a, a, you know, a deep problem in this country, and of course not only in the South. But um, I'm absolutely sure that if we're doing historical reckoning, we should not focus on, on that one axis. Does that answer your question? Great. So um, just a couple more and then we'll invite others to uh, throw out questions. So I'm really fascinated the passages in which you, you um, identify living in two different cultures with being able to understand what is humanity. So I think it is true that you're, you get perspective on yourself. You, if you live in a different culture, speak a different language, uh, aren't trapped, aren't the prisoner of one linguistic cultural framework. It gives you um, depth perception. but. Um, Human beings, we're interested in mankind, human beings have 
limited conductivity, limited empathy, limited capacity. You can't, nobody identifies with all mankind. Uh, there isn't a single hierarchy of wrongs that everyone in the world will share. All attention to injustice is selective, and it's selective for a lot of reasons, and there is not a, there isn't, and if you tried to enforce on the world a single hierarchy of wrongs, so you see in the global south, they're not interested in saying that Russia's homicidal rampage in Ukraine is the most important thing in the world. They don't think it, and Europeans do think it. So this is, and it's not gonna happen. So again, I like, I very much like, and I think you have an answer to this, there's a way in which you say, by living in different cultures, you're in touch with something deep about the human condition and about what, uh, well, you explained it maybe better than I yeah. can, because I think it's fascinating. Well, I, you, so, Look, you're absolutely right. Nobody can, uh, you know, get a perspective, uh, particularly since what I'm talking about is that, you know, people seeking a deeper perspective than you can get by, you know, whatever it is. This is Tuesday, and, you know, here I am taking a selfie. Um, uh, why people like taking selfies is a mystery to me, but let's leave that alone. Um, but what one can do is choose. I my advice would be to choose two cultures that, are, that one didn't grow up in. Because if you only choose one, you're stuck in this kind of you know, dialectic, well, you know, we do it this way here and they do it that way there. Two, at, and it can almost be totally at random, you fall in love with someone from another culture or you have a good friend from another culture or uh, you, know, you get an invitation to be somewhere and you realize you're fascinated with Ireland, in my case, oddly enough, you know? I mean, um, and you then decide to devote yourself to, I mean, Ireland just happens to be one where I've lived in two other countries and worked in two other countries. I think working somewhere is really important. I, I, it's quite different than even studying somewhere. Um, and what you learn by delving into as much as you can the music and the literature and the history uh, and hopefully a foreign language of the other place is first of all you learn about real diversity you learn then reflexively about your own assumptions the assumptions that you have about the world that it turns out they don't have um, but then you also learn about this common universality and uh, you know if you if you do it with two different cultures that you didn't grow up in you get both diversity and universality at the same time and then you can say mutatis mutandis i'm never going to do it for peru but i can assume you know, that I would find other interesting and similar things. And this is what drives me nuts about the idea of cultural appropriation. Because the, oh, first of all, I don't think culture is, um, is a commodity. Um, I mean, yes, it's a commodity. Yes, there's a culture industry. But it's, um, you know, culture is not the kind of thing that ought to be and can be owned. Culture wants to... Um, wants to spread. Anthony Appiah wrote a very nice book about I that a couple your of example, years ago. That the slaves who were singing "Go Down, Moses," were they committing a sin of cultural appropriation? Precisely. A and I found out and this was really interesting. Um, um, the slave owners actually created Bibles without the story of Exodus because they were afraid that they would influence. Uh, um, they were afraid of cultural appropriation, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, what else was I going to say about that? Um, yeah, okay. So, um, while talking, I mean, there are many examples of things we recognize. Just a, a sentence here to give you a little bit of the flavor of things that are very particular about which all of us know. So at a certain point, she talks about linguistic, this is you know, sanctimonious policing of language, words. Uh, linguistic uh, changes are meant to express respect for people they name, but an unhoused person is no better off than a homeless one. If anything, the softened language makes the condition sound less painful. Being homeless is deeper and worse than being unhoused, and the harshness of the language reflected the harshness of the reality. So, Susan also talks about other uh, things that are upsetting or remind her, for example, the, the idea that a white person can't write about uh, 
uh, non-white people or that a straight actor can't play non-straight roles and so on reminded her of the idea that um, German music could only be played by Aryans and so on. So that I think is all uh, you know, very powerful resonances that have, would disturb you about whatever the wokeness phenomena. So the three, there are three uh, uh, principles that for you to find the left, that is universalism, not tribalism, that justice and power have to be defined separately or should be kept separate in some way, and the belief that progress is possible. So that's the way the book is structured. That's just one thing. That's, that's, those are three principles that are common both to liberals and the left. And, the and then the that's why fourth principle. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The fourth principle um, that would distinguish the left from the liberal is that in addition to political rights, we also have what are called social rights, and they're not benefits, and they're not entitlements, and they're not safety nets, but they're coded into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and um, those are not utopian. So that, that would be the difference between okay. leftism so and So that liberal. makes me ask, why are you, so you make a big point of saying, I am not an ally. So why do you say that? An ally of the social, racial justice. Yeah, movement. because um, when I hear the word ally, I think of the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, I, I mean, um, that happens to be the example that comes to mind. But alliances are based on shared interests that are very often temporary, okay? Which is why alliances are often very short. Solidarity is based on principle. And what bothers me about the notion of allyship is, uh, first of all, a, you know, a division between the, a real movement and the people who are allies. So, which suggests that the reason why the people who are motivated by the real movement are, of course, motivated by their self-interest, right? I mean, it, all of the ideologies that I talk about, and I talk about them briefly, um, and whether it's um, Schmidt or whether it's evolutionary psychology, which I think has done an enormous amount of damage. Not a, a left-wing theory, of course, at all. It was started out as sociobiology and was deeply criticized by the left, and then it disappeared for about a decade and a half, and guess when? <laughs> <laughs> just at the end of state socialism and the triumph of neoliberalism, it emerged again in a slightly more sophisticated form as evolutionary psychology. And that's just taken to be the scientific explanation of human behavior um, for everyone. And it fits perfectly with a kind of Schmidtian, Foucauldian view. Tell everyone about kinship detectors. Ah, Steven Pinker. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't remember that um, quote by heart. It was a long quote that I used. I, I can tell a story about a debate that I once had with Steven Pinker at a conference at Harvard. Some of you on, on ethics and evolutionary psychology, some of you will remember, um, Jesus, I swore I would never forget his name, Wesley... Autry. Wesley Autry, the so-called subway hero, the man who jumped, the black construction worker in something like 2007, who saw a white Columbia student, um, and there, it's unclear whether he was having an epileptic fit or whether he was on a lot of drugs. He fell into the subway in front of an on-rushing train. Wesley Autry, who was taking his two daughters to school, um, jumped into the subway, pressed the man down, the train rolled over both of them, they both survived, okay? And there was, it, he was in the news a lot deservedly so. And maybe a year or so later, I happened to be at a conference that Steven Pinker was also at, and I thought this was a pretty interesting um, counterexample to evolutionary psychology because if, according to evolutionary psychology, altruism is a problem, because right, altruism is a problem. I mean, think about that for a second, that um, you know, our, our, our scientific, so-called scientific view of human nature, apart the fact that, from the fact that we have no access to what our prehistoric ancestors did, um, 
we have a theory of human nature which tries to solve the problem of altruism. Okay, um, why do people act in ways that might go against their interest in reproducing themselves? Okay, and the solution to the so-called problem of altruism is that well we might sacrifice ourselves in various ways for our kin okay and uh, because the gene pool will um, you know be carried on I mean I think, I think there's a funny formula in there you would sacrifice yourself for half a child or four nephews or something like that it's really quite funny so I bring up this example because, uh, and then they say, well, so kin, you know, in, in prehistoric days, kin was the whole tribe, and then these kinship detectors kept going on to larger cities and so on. Um, so I brought up this example because um, why on this theory would a black construction worker who's a single father of two children um, risk his life to save a white 20-year-old Columbia student? And it was kind of funny to see Steven Pinker come up with these excuses. And, you know, he kept coming up and coming up. And finally I said, okay. Why do we all admire this person? We're kind of in awe of him. Um, at the time, everybody was talking about it. And he said, oh, we don't admire him because we hope that in a similar situation, we might be that heroic. We hope that other people admire him so that if we fell into the subway, someone would be fooled into doing it for us. You know, anyway. Um, I <laughs> So solidarity across racial barriers is just when your kinship detectors are tricked. So just one last uh, question. You, about power and justice. <clears throat> so you give, you know, examples of where power is, uh, is relevant to justice. Like, for example, uh, Cold War civil rights. This was a, a war against the Soviet Union. We were, the support for civil rights was in large part, uh, or in to at least to a large extent, uh, a, an echo of the need to deal with the Soviet Union propaganda about American racism and so on. Um, John Stuart Mill says, I don't know how you would react to that, that to say that rights depend on power, you know, that big landowners had their rights defended before orphans, let's say, um, that's, that is uh, not cynical, it's an instruction to you to get power. If you want to have women's rights or workers' rights, you should, have, you should organize. And you can organize, of course, around an ideal justice, but still you need power. So it's not, so I'm, I'm, this is just a question of how you think of this relation between what's just and, and the need for power yeah. in order to do justice. Yeah, um, great question, and it's really, really tricky to decide in particular cases, which is why I think so many people, starting with Foucault and all of his acolytes, just decide, forget it. Um, there's, you, you can't ever distinguish the two, because there are, of course, so many cases of people, um, you know, claiming to be acting for the sake of, of justice or democracy. Um, and in fact, be simply working towards their own hegemony. I mean, the great, the great example that I think we need to, you know, that should be on people's minds right now, uh, is the war in Iraq was clearly a scam. I mean, we knew it was a scam. Most of us knew it was a scam. I mean, I, I sat there and thinking that the, you know, the politicians who later said, "If I knew what I knew now," and I. I was sitting there thinking, you know, I, I, I have never had a security clearance. Um, I, I was trained to read Kant. And if I can sit in Berlin and see that if they had a good reason to go to war, they wouldn't keep offering six, you know, that's okay. But so that was the kind of case where, you know, Bush and his people wanted all kinds of things, but democracy and justice, it wasn't. But then you have people, and of course, we see this at the moment, the opposition to uh, arming Ukraine. There are plenty of people who argue this is just another case of Western hegemony, 
and we ought to throw up our arms. No, throw up our arms, throw up our hands <laughs> rather than giving arms. Um, you know, I, in fact, I, as much as uh, I'm disturbed by the fact that I agree with, of all people, Henry Kissinger, that NATO shouldn't have been expanded to the east, um, you know, there seems to be, for me, no question that not giving arms to Ukraine at the moment is like not giving arms uh, in the Spanish Civil War. You know, I mean, that's, that's, there's, there isn't a question right now. But it's very easy to confuse those and to get quite cynical and resigned about ever trying to make the dis distinction. And of course, you're right. We need power if we want effective justice. But if that's all we want, and I refer people who haven't watched it to the wonderful um, televised debate between Chomsky and Foucault on Dutch television. It's floating around YouTube. If you haven't seen it, um, it says everything about this subject that I think you need to know. No, this is, this is great, and I want to I open it up and, and keep the conversation going. I actually want to I want to start with a, a couple of questions, Susan, if you don't mind. That there. there um, there are a few things that were on my mind reading the book, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I want to ask of you a kind of sociological question and then also an ideas question. And the sociological co question comes a little bit from my own personal history. I was a student during what was thought of as the first big wave of uh, debates about identity politics on campus. And I was uh, at Berkeley. I just missed Todd at Berkeley, but I you know, knew Todd well and, and miss having him around. But I remember his book, Twilight of Common Dreams. And um, it seems to me like he took up a, a, many of the same kinds of questions that you're taking up now in, in a very different way. Um, but it raises for me the, the, a, different, a version of what I brought up in the beginning, which is kind of what is woke. And I guess the sociological question is, I, I wonder about if you could say something about your assessment of, this, of the situation here that you're concerned about. How prevalent is the kind of position taking that you're writing against here? Is it, is it your view that this has kind of seized the left? Has it, has it um, seized the, the campus? Um, and that's kind of why I was wondering what you meant by woke. It's hard for me to tell uh, the extent to which this kind of thinking, you know, identity t determines your position and also your capacity to make uh, a, 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 a reasoned and informed judgment. It's hard for me to tell how much of that is an active idea that's animating politics today or campus politics today even, and how much of it is uh, this kind of uh, bogeyman that the right has created to discredit all kinds of things. So, so I, I, I just, I don't, know, I don't have my, an answer, but I'm curious how you see it. And the other thing I, which, you know, maybe- How about letting me just add that, that was about sure. six questions. Can I answer those sure, first? Sure, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> and then please ask another. Sure. So a word about Todd Gitlin, who I really, truly miss. He was a good friend of mine for 20 years. And um, we did, as I say in the book, we did think starting around the late summer, early around September 2020, just as Black Lives Matter, which both of us had been, um, you know, extremely hopeful about, started turning into, again, more of an identity politics, more of, yes, well, they're the, they're the actors and then they're the white alleys, if you want to be. Um, so we actually, um, both quarantining and, and all of that, start, started getting together and planned to write a book just about that, if you like a, you know, a remake in certain ways with more philosophy in it from my side um, of Twilight of Common Dreams, which I still think is a really valuable book to read and very prescient. Um, you know, given that Todd wrote it 25 years ago. So that's just a word. We did not plan to talk about the other couple of principles that I talk about in the book, but um, so I, um, you know, owe a lot of my thinking about these to a lot of conversations uh, with Todd. So, um, you know, Zichonal Avrachal, for anybody who still speaks Hebrew. Um, that's the first thing. How prevalent is it? Look, I wish it were just in the United States. You have no idea how far <laughs> this has spread from American campuses to, um, you know, at least all of the European countries that I have been in lately, and that includes England, Holland, France, Germany. Okay, those are all places where 
it's almost the first conversation that I have with other intellectuals or people in the arts. And it's not just campuses, and it's not just politics, it's culture, it's what gets published, it's what kinds of, you know, theater gets made, it's what kinds of exhibits get made, and, um, you know, I, I had a number of friends, a couple of friends anyway, who said, Susan, we agree with your arguments, but please don't use the word woke. Um, you know, you're giving aid and comfort to the right if you use the woke as, as a term of abuse. And I really worked hard so, I mean, this is one reason why I didn't go on about cancel culture. I didn't want to be snarky. I didn't want to be... It, it's easy to make fun of certain impulses. Um, but I think that the... Um, I think the aims of most of the people who are woke are my aims. Um, but I think it's being done the wrong way, and let me give you sort of, first of all, I think to define woke, I would define it as the reverse of the three principles that I think are crucial to being on the liberal left. So woke is tribalist rather than universalist. It has given up um, trying to maintain a distinction between justice and power because it believes that all such distinctions are part of liberal enlightenment philosophy that um, was an attempt to impose particular values on the world that don't hold, okay? Um, and finally, although, and this is the really funny thing, um, although there are plenty of woke activists who genuinely are working for progress, um, they're, they have a very Foucaultian view about the possibility of progress. That is that every step forward, in fact, leads to a more subtle and pervasive form of domination. And you see this when people talk about um, whether or not there's been progress in the past. That is, it's extremely hard for people on the walk to admit you know, that there, I mean, take, take the Lincoln discussion, okay? Um, I'm really glad that the Confederate generals are going down and that the generic Johnny Rebs are going down and, you know, I think they belong in a nice museum of the kind that we have in um, Berlin. We have a museum for sort of disgraced statues where they're not on pedestals and children are encouraged to climb on them, make fun of them and all of that. I mean, I'm all for various creative ways of dealing with that stuff. Um, removing Lincoln, because yes, he said some racist things, um, strikes me as pretty outrageous because, for two reasons. Um, one is, um, can we be glad that we've actually made some progress in thinking about racism and in deeper and more subtle ways than Lincoln was able to do 170 years ago or whatever it was? We have made progress since Lincoln's time, okay? And that's something to rejoice in. But if we've made progress, we made it on the backs of people like Abraham Lincoln who died for civil rights of formerly enslaved um, African Americans, and you know, it's it's those kinds of moves that I think are are not only you know deeply wrongheaded and unfair, but um, but very self undermining. Okay, uh, I don't know. Have I answered your question yet? All, all six of them. So in fact, um, I think that that's I've had more than my fair share. So um, Sam, I'm going to give you the mic. Um, let's see, Adam here. I'm just going to point at people and and. Let you ask. Uh, thanks so much. This is a wonderful talk. Um, I have two questions, but if you only can answer one of them, that's fine. I'm wondering whether you think this this language about allies also reflects just the degraded state of citizenship in advanced Western democracies. And uh, my second question has to do with. Um, 
Foucault. Well, you mentioned that, that there, there's a strain of what you think is Foucaultianism in the thinking of contemporary anti-racist movements. And I'm wondering, though, whether there's also a resemblance between the kind of metaphysical understanding of anti-blackness, ahistorical or trans-historical understanding of anti-blackness for contemporary anti-racism of the kind of Kendi variety, and uh, the fatalistic dark strain of Zionism where the Jew is the eternal victim. Thank you. Um, I mean, I can say yes and yes um, to both of the questions. I mean, yes, because of the, you know, uh, ally reflects the degraded sense of citizenship because we no longer have a robust uh, concept of citizenship, but we have a concept of fellow consumer, you know, but um, it's, it's very hard to see much of a common project uh, or a set of common principles, so yes. But absolutely, it's my thinking about, uh, you know, the sort of Jew that, uh, you know, repeats next week, every year, in every generation, they rose up to destroy us and, uh, you know, talks about anti-Semitism being the worst uh, form of discrimination and the oldest and so on and so on. And I have no more truck with that than I do with uh, Afro-pessimism. I mean, I think they're, they're both strains of the same thing. There's a lot to say about, about that. In particular, um, and, and this is something that puzzles me, and actually my next book is about heroes and victims, so that's going to be a much longer book, but um, I wanted to get this out because it seemed like it might be useful and urgent. Um, there's a real question about what draws us to identify with the parts of ourselves, with our experiences over which we have the least agency. Why has that become in the last, and it's about 70 years, why has that become the focus of human identity? Um, because when you talk about identity politics, the odd thing, and I go on about it a bit, is of course we all have lots of identities and different identities at different times and, and um, you know, um, choosing these two components, ethnic background and gender, as the defining features of human beings is not only reductionist, but it's also choosing the things you know, over which we're most helpless. So thank you for the comparison. Yes, it's been on my mind a lot. Thanks. Hi, um, also I have in the spirit of the evening two questions. <laughs> so um, you said uh, Germany did a good job dealing with his past. So that's not quite true. Um, West Germany, actually the intellectual part of West Germany may or may not have did a good job. East Germany did nothing of that. They are seeing themselves as the eternal resistance fighters. And neither did Austria. Austria is seeing themselves as the victims. Still, they all have arrived at the same point. So how does that come? No, well, so I'm sorry that I won't be able to answer that question okay. in any depth. I profoundly disagree with you. Okay. And I wrote a 400-page book to explain why. Mm -hmm. It's in paper. It's called Learning from the Germans. Okay. Um, and in that, I argue that actually the East did a better job. It's the, view, you know, it's the most controversial thing in the book. I've gotten hate mail mm -hmm. from Vessies because of it. Um, I had it fact-checked by two German historians. Um, I knew it would be controversial. It's just not true. Um, I've got numbers to show that it's not okay. true, and I interviewed an awful lot of former East Germans. So that's number one. And the, um, the number Austrians? two, the, oh, the Austrians are hopeless. I mean, as an Austrian, <laughs> as an Austrian friend of mine, so yeah. this generation is slightly better. As an Austrian friend of mine um, used to say, you know, how can you expect the Austrians to have? Um, uh, you know, worked through the Second World War, they haven't even come to terms with the first. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the, the generation of people who are now between 40 and 50 are doing a, certainly a better job than the people who were older in Austria, but there's a reason why the Austrian right-wing party has been in the wings and, you know, um, still gets an awful lot of 
uh, has an awful lot of influence. Now, unfortunately, West Germany also, or, or Germany has the AfD. Um, we have a right-wing party. Historical reckoning is not foolproof, and I did not say I want to, I mean, I, I, I hope I made it clear that I have changed my <coughs> views as the facts have changed about what the West Germans did. They first, I mean, first of all, including in that book, they, the historical reckoning that they did was slow, fitful, most people were against it. It really took at least 40 years. And yes, you're certainly right that it was driven largely by intellectuals, church groups, artists, and for the first 40 years, okay? So all of that is true. Um, but they did, compared to any other countries dealing with mm -hmm. its historical reckoning, they did a pretty good job. But it's not foolproof, and yeah. mm -hmm. so we have a right-wing party. Okay, so... Hi, this is a great, great talk. Um, I'm just trying to imagine a audience from 30 years from now listening to this conversation and saying, Jesus, where's climate change in this conversation? And, 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 I, and, I, and the point here is, to what extent do you think this outburst of, tri of weird be politics is kind of a reaction formation or something against the horrible hugeness of what we really should be thinking about, and we just run in, that, there, that, it's, that it's the hot storm from the, for, from the future, fracture, fracturing everything that would be real politics, that, that would be appropriate politics? That's a great question. And, um, you know, I had, I've done some thinking about, you know, where in the world, as somebody who's a public intellectual, at least in some places, you know, where my voice can be effective. And I feel like if we don't get away from tribalism, we will not be able to do anything about climate change. For, so that's, partly because tribalism fractures potential citizenship. You know, absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, so so that if we don't see, I mean, and my aside from thinking that hope is a moral obligation and not a feeling, that's mm -hmm. a Kantian view that's also held by Noam Chomsky, by the way. Um, <laughs> You know, my, my reason for thinking that there's a, you know, a glimmer of hope on the horizon is that climate change has got to, one would think, make people realize that the kind of tribal interests that dominate both national and international politics are um, stark raving mad in the face of the things that we need to master together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, look, I, I think an awful, an awful lot of, you know, in particular some of the, the language wars that are taking place among the woke are reaction formations. I mean, it's, you know, it's much easier. Somebody's going to tweet something nasty about me for saying this, but I'll say it anyway. Um, it's just easier to change your pronouns than to change anything more substantive about the rest of the world. Um. Thanks. Um, I make a lot of use of formal debates in my classes. And um, a few years ago, students wanted to speak their real opinion in debates. They wanted to choose which side they were going to take. Now, nobody wants to do that. They want me to allocate which side they're taking so they can keep their real opinion private. Uh, as little as five years ago, the only students who wanted to keep their, uh, their real opinions private were those from the People's Republic of China who were concerned that someone was going to write this down and report them to the embassy. Now, it's almost universal here. Is that your experience? In, in Europe? So, um, I don't teach on a regular basis, um, but I certainly hear an awful lot of self-censorship and an awful lot of, you know, when, 
when one gets into a circle of people having coffee or lunch or whatever it is whom one trusts, people will say things like that. Well, I would have said, I mean, look, I will say it. Um, it doesn't matter who, I, I once said on a, a Zoom talk in New York, this was a year ago when we thought the Republicans were going to take over both houses of uh, Congress. And I was talking to New York students and I told them about Freedom Summer, um, which of course they didn't know anything about. And I said, look, um, you know, there were New York students who died for other people's right to vote. Um, and in the name of uh, Andrew Goodman and Mickey Schwerner, it would be really good if students, you know, stopped worrying about pronouns and did some voter registration. For saying that, I was called transphobic. I wasn't even thinking, I mean, this shows that I'm not out of the, but I still have somebody who follows me occasionally on Twitter, and when somebody says something nice about me on Twitter, they she's transphobic. Anyway, I mean, my response, of course, was, um, you know, trans people are going to be the first to be hit if we have a fascist or proto-fascist government. But yes, I know people self-censoring all over the place. And um, I decided not to talk about this issue because it seems to swallow everything in the book. But I have heard from people who've read the book so far that, you know, it expresses things that they were saying in private but didn't say in public. So I, we just have to start, that's all. Um, I, I, we just have to start saying it. Um, I, I, I always thought myself as a socialist. Now I don't say that anymore, right? And so I want to give you a, a couple of small anecdotes. I'm quite old, and I've been retired a long time. So when I was teaching here, and, I would, and most of the uh, students were female, they would write he, and I'd put a slash and S. Then they write it she. Then they started writing he again, so at which point I said, how come you're doing this? I can't believe the answer. And they would call me by my first name. Oh shit, Elliot, we know who the hell we are. So now that's, that, that, and the other anecdote that I would like to tell you is that I was very friendly with a South African intellectual. He taught at Rutgers here. And he was the last person to leave before Nelson Mandela was arrested. He came here and he went back to South Africa. And he held a meeting at South Africa in our place. And um, a couple of, guys from Harlem came down and yelled, what are we doing in this honky house? In which case, a South African man got up and said, you keep your mouth shut. If you don't shut your mouth, you leave. And it just, you know, all of this begins to resonate with me. The older I get and the more confused I get. And I'm really glad to hear you, you know, say, I, I don't know that you hold some of the same odd circumstances that I seem to be burdened with. So about being afraid of the word socialism, very interesting, a good friend of mine who's an Einstein specialist was giving a talk of Einstein's worldview. And at one point he said something like, you know, well, Einstein cared a lot about social justice. So I go after him, I, I go up to him after the talk and I say, look, you know just as well as I do that Einstein called himself a socialist all his life. Um, he wrote a book, Why Socialism, a short book, Why Socialism, in 1947, the high, you know, beginning of the Cold War. Why didn't you say it? So he sort of hems and haws, he said, well, he didn't have an original social theory. Um, you don't have to be a, to have an original uh, economic theory to have a to be a socialist. And he finally acknowledged that the term had become so toxic that one didn't want to apply it to the sweet um, Albert Einstein we all know and love. But Jay has a question. I do. So coming in with Ren, um, I do think for the right anything but climate, right? 
But I don't think that's a fair claim. So, so the question is, I agree with everything you want to say that's wrong with woke, except one thing. It comes out of a deep despair of a political failure, right? So we, we have a history, um, and, and my, uh, someone I was undergraduate with, Bob Stepto, who set up African American studies at Yale, and 20 years ago he said, the great experiment of a multiracial society thus far is a failure. And, and there's been progress, but the, the failure of something that could be done and that uh, a collective citizen, body of citizens, has failed to do. The level of, of you know, infant mortality, of, of hunger, of the homeless, all wholly unnecessary, a simple lack of political will. So, so there's, there's a real historic problem, uh, and I think woke is a reaction formation to failure, um, and, and that the, it's a symptom of that failure, so that, of course, it blocks better politics, but, but the, there's a historical social actuality that's painful, and one of the reasons I want to suggest is the difference from Germany. That the notion of historical reckoning is pretty easy to do because they didn't have, say, 70 million Jews to deal with. <laughs> they didn't have a other population. We actually don't know how to do this. So, so there's a question about how to achieve mutual recognition and one of the things I keep thinking about is, is Hegel, not Kant, said there can only be, you know, Fanon argued, you can't give people equality. You cannot give them equality. There has to be equal power. I don't think we know what it is to achieve that kind of equality. And it's that historical frustration that generated what is, I agree, a terrible political process. I have been hearing quite a bit from uh, a mutual friend of ours, one of your colleagues, about the strike at the New School as a perfect example of everything that's wrong with woke. So, right. yes. So look, Jay, that's quite helpful. Um, be, for the following reason, um, I it's become clear and clear to me that the left, and I, I please, let, you know, again, I think I said this before, let's not confuse historical reckoning with racial reckoning. A historical reckoning is, needs to be much broader than that. Um, the left never did a historical reckoning after 91. We were just floored. We were flabbergasted. We didn't expect it. I know so many people who went like straight from, you know, nights of arguing whether they were Gramscians or Trotskyists or whatever to, you know, oh, I always knew it went straight to the gulag. I mean, <laughs> so many people flipped. Um, and people who didn't flip were, just felt quite helpless. I can remember, um, you know, how helpless I felt myself, okay? And, you know, then came barreling, you know, there is no alternative and, and neoliberalism and uh, totally reinforced, I think, by evolutionary psychology. And we never really rethought um, where did socialism go wrong, where did it turn to Stalinism. We, we just didn't do that work. And maybe we couldn't under the shock of all of the stuff that happened. And maybe, you know, now is the time to do that. What you're pointing out, though, about the disappointment, uh, when did we start seeing these woke phenomena? It's actually... Um, you know, towards the end of the Obama administration and the beginning of the Trump administration and the shock of the hopes that Obama truly, genuinely raised. Let's not forget them, okay? Um, eight years of that family in the White House um, was not the country that any of us were born in, okay? And... Um, 
but the ways in which that could then, you know, turn into a backlash. Um, I think you're right. It led to despair and to more despair on the part of the young than perhaps our part, although um, I, you know, I, I've had some pretty despairing moments. And by the way, I think it's wrong to look at, at, at woke as a generational problem because the gatekeepers who are still in their 50s, 60s, early 70s, um, I know plenty of people who have rushed you know, to make sure that they are woker than thou. So it's not just generational. But I like your point about despair. Thank you. Uh, hi, I teach at NYU, and I'm a sort of surprised by Eric's question asking, is this a real phenomenon? <laughs> um, if you teach at NYU, you know that wokeness and DEI are very real phenomena, just as much as this chair is a real chair. Um, and I think it's very hard if you want to put forth a different kind of leftist thinking, a universalist enlightenment view, although a lot of students are actually eager to hear that, I have to say. But it's very hard to do that for, I think, three reasons. One, you're terrified of being called racist. You have a big R on you, this scarlet R. Two, you're aiding the right. You're Ron DeSantis. But three, which is a little bit more complicated, is that you don't want to be undermining genuine projects towards racial justice. And that makes it very, very complicated, at least for me. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem, um, a, a, as I see it. I just want to say a couple of other things. There's a whole class element, I think, to the whole woke thing. First off, woke is not a critique of capitalism at all. Second of all, my partner Jay here um, is speaking about despair. I understand that, but what's interesting to me is that often, and you see this in New York City, that working class black communities are not woke. That wokeness is very much an elite project. You saw that in the last mayoral election. You see it all the time. I mean, I could go through many, many instances of what the woke uh, project is, you know, all tests are racist, et cetera, et cetera, um, versus the way that black working class people in this city are voting and expressing themselves. So there's a real class element. The third thing I wanted to say, sort of a, uh, just an addendum about this question of allyship, is that there's a very, very beautiful essay called Preparing Ourselves for Freedom that was written by Albie Sachs. Albie Sachs was a white Jewish member of the ANC. Uh, and he, the, the South African police tried to kill him. They blew out his eye. They destroyed his arm. So he paid a very high price. And he wrote this beautiful essay in that period after the ANC was debanned before the elections called Preparing Ourselves for Freedom. And he speaks very, very directly to this question of allyship and why, as a white South African, he is not an ally. And so I recommend that to What's anyone. What's it called again? What's it's, it called, called? it's called Preparing Ourselves for Freedom. It's also a piece that he, where he disputes very much the idea that art is a, quote, weapon in the struggle. Um, uh, and that art does not have, a, a gun is a weapon. It has a direct aim. Uh, that's not what art is. So it's a very, very subtle, very, very beautiful piece, and I recommend it to people. Thank you. I mean, it sounds like there used to be a, a song that I grew up in called Medgar Evers' Lullaby. I don't know if anybody else ever heard it, but it, it ended with the line, all men are slaves till their brothers are free. Um, so I, yeah. Um, and I agree with you that supporting genuine anti-racist work without falling into this is complicated and difficult and you know every case is different that's you just have to pay attention to I'll be brief um, I agree with everything everyone has said except <laughs> and I hate all that that stuff but um, one thing and that is in my travels through the world, it seems to me that there are some extremely quote woke, unquote people, extremely annoying people. It's pronoun city all the way, but they do do the work. 
You know, if you look at who raises money for abortion funds, it's, it's all uh, the most pro-trans, pro-my pronouns, um, people that you could possibly imagine, and they do tremendous things at, at, um, in, in some very not safe situations. And so every time the sort of woke discussion gets beyond the theoretical of Foucault and all the rest of it, I think, well, what about all those people on the ground who are doing great things? This goes back to Stephen's first question, um, and uh, you know about what distinguishes my critique from someone like Ron DeSantis who wants to outlaw Bush, everything in the world that we care about. Um, look, I tried really hard to find the right tone. I'm not 100% sure that I've done it. But honestly, none of my kids has read this book yet. And my <laughs> guess is at least one would hate it. Um, two, I might, you know, sort of... Uh, you know, see some things. And so, I mean, I'm not talking about people who are um, strangers and, God forbid, not enemies, okay? I'm talking about people who are doing progressive work um, who I would simply like to do it better, okay? Because I think it would be good for all of us. So, I, I, and I asked some, you know, a variety of people. I didn't ask one of my kids. I figured that would be too tricky, but I did ask my very woke niece among a number of about, you know, 10 or 12 people who I asked to read the manuscript and critique it. Some people thought I wasn't hard enough on the woke. Some people thought I was too hard on the woke. I mean, um, I, I, I think you're right to point that out and that we just need to proceed with care. And the absolute last thing, and this is the thing that I end the book with, um, you know, fascism would never have triumphed if the left hadn't been split. And the very last thing that we need right now is, um, you know, those kinds of battles. Um, hello. So thank you for that discussion. Uh, my question, I guess, comes from my sociological background, maybe. Um, but uh, the discourse and the practices that you're talking about and that you call work, um, who are they coming from? Like, what is maybe the, the fieldwork or the people you're talking about when you talk about like work people or their practices. Um, and I am asking that because uh, a lot of people that I, I would qualify as work if I use your definition, uh, because like I'm a, maybe to introduce myself, I'm a PhD um, in sociology in France and I'm working on like popular education grassroots organization and their relationship to inequalities. And so a lot of them could be called uh, work if I use your definition, but um, like a lot of them would talk not only on about race and gender, but also like on class, also on environment and climate change, especially by thinking that like everybody is going to be impacted by climate change, but maybe not in the same way, and in that some marginalized group, like because of their class, social, like um, gender or race, would be like impacted more. Also, a lot of them talk about like universalism, but maybe they try to like change the definition of universalism and like try to advocate for an universalism that is taking into account everybody in the way that, as they would put it, um, not to be blind to social differences and the inequalities that are linked to these social differences. And same for, we talk about capitalism, but like these people also like uh, would put capitalism as responsible for class, but also for gender and race inequalities. So um, yeah, that's the reason why I'm asking like, where does your, um, yeah, your discourse about work, where is it grounded on? Because I'm a bit confused because what I can see from my fake work, it doesn't really fit uh, with what you were saying. And so I think it's really interesting to so have that I discussion. So I don't know why you're doing your field work. Are you doing it in France? Yeah, in France. Okay, so I have been told that the French woke discussion is actually quite different from either, and the discussions that I've followed, because my language is, is better, are the American, the English, and the German, which are almost identical. And my publisher has, told, my French publisher has said, before this book comes out in France, you have to get the, the French, um, the French nuances right, so which I'm happy to do. So I think it is a, a genuinely different discussion. I've heard this from a number of people. But where it's coming from in the countries that I know of are, I believe, you know, it began in the universities. And I think 
Jay's point about its be beginning from despair, and I think beginning about 2016, um, is, is absolutely right. But it has moved to publishing, it has moved to um, you know, media, it has moved to um, you know, cultural institutions in at least the three countries whose languages I master well enough to follow on a daily basis, okay? Hi, uh, I'll keep my question brief. So I think um, in, um, in this discussion that uh, often involves citizenship, uh, racism, identity politics, and the need to distinguish between different concepts, a thinker that often resurfaces in my mind is Hannah An. Um, I wonder if you have any insight into what aspect of her work that is still quite relevant in our discussion today. Um, yeah, um, thank you. Well, I just want to uh, I, I go back to Eric's question and this question before last. Uh, it's the sociological side of it. I, I really I have the, the, the impression that a lot of what you're talking about is happening in America, and you say in Germany, and you mention a few countries, but I, I really think that there has to be a difference between these different countries. And in particular, also, the other aspect of the sociological question, which is raised by Susie, is, is she says this is an elitist phenomenon. And I just wonder to what extent it is, to what extent, in, well, to put it more precisely, voting. To what extent is this going to make a difference? Is it already making a difference into how people are behaving politically and voting? That's my question. Okay. One last question. Hi, thank you. Um, one reference for you was recently Maurice Mitchell from the Working Families Party wrote a piece in both Convergence and Nonprofit Quarterly talking about how a lot of these dynamics show up within organizing communities and harm our tactics and how we're kind of doing the work of building power with each other. Um, the question that I had for you was about profit because, uh, well, recently I saw a man walking down the street with a black rock sweater and also a pin that said Black Lives Matter and a rainbow flag and it made me want to throw up. Um, and I'm thinking about how much wokeness um, maybe has had particular success and spread because it uh, is particularly be able to be appropriated by the likes of corporate power, particularly big tech right now. Um, you know, particular people profit from being profitable in social media in relation to wokeness, um, but you know the greatest of which are the people who control corporate social media, um, and philanthropy and kind of these giant institutions where wokeness becomes a mask for not dealing with the other huge material conditions of uh, what's happening inside of our institutions. So I think, yeah, I'm just thinking about uh, spread, dissemination, and all of that in relation to profit. So thank you. I mean that speaks to both uh, Steve's and 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 Susie's um, remarks. There's a good book by a young philosopher named Olafemi Taiwo called Elite Capture, which talks exactly about this. Okay, um, it's a short book and it just gives examples of the ways in which people with black rock sweaters are supporting, well, claim to be supporting Black Lives Matter. And, and I, I do think, as um, Susie pointed out before, it's, um, it's not a movement of uh, the, you know, anything like the working classes at all. And in fact, and this goes to Steve Luke's point about um, what the political uh, effect is, frankly, it's driving people either into the arms of the right, and I, I actually know, I thought I had no relative, I, I thought, I have a lot of crazy relatives, but I fortunately was never in the position of having to say, you know, there's an uncle who voted for Trump that I have to meet at Thanksgiving or something. Never, never, never. Um, I just spent time with a first cousin who um, 
you know, but I, I mean, this is just anecdotal. I, one reads lots of stories about people who are either being driven into the arms of the right because of this, or I think the more common one, at least among most of the people that I hang out with, is a sense of um, just resigned despair, of feeling that we don't have a political home because the left is kind of, you know, the people who are being called the left and the woke left, uh, you know, are not a place that we can feel excited about identifying with, to put it very, very mildly. Um, and, you know, so sitting out a lot of forms of political action, um, you know, is, is one consequence and the other is really moving towards the right. It's interesting if, uh, Young student, um, really smart young student, um, was the first person who said to me, and she was even she was in high school at the time, um, in the summer of 2016, Trump is going to win because of political correctness, and you know the word woke had not wasn't yet invented, and um, you know it, it, it was prescient. Arendt, last, very, very briefly, there's a lot of Arendt that's relevant, and, and Arendt is somebody who I've you know, done lots of work on and respect a great deal. The one thing that I quote from her in this book is in the context of my saying I'm not an ally. And it's a little remark that she made in Eichmann in Jerusalem when she said he should have been indicted for crimes against humanity, not for crimes against the Jewish people. And that is a much deeper thought, I think, than even she realized at the time, but it's absolutely right, and that's why I say I'm not an ally. Um, okay. okay, so that's Thank you. Ter ter terrific. We, we've all been reading um, about the rise of um, Latino and also Asian American voters uh, on the right and this transformation. I don't know that that's explained by this phenomenon, but certainly one of the possibilities. Um, I want to thank you for opening up a, a great debate, and um, it's one that we'll be taking up uh, many future nights, and we hope you'll come back. Stephen, we'll get you back here as well. Thanks to all of you for um, coming out tonight. Please uh, return to the IPK. Uh, just a quick logistics matter. Um, we're short an elevator or two here, so there is a stairway on the right. For those of you who feel comfortable taking the stairs, it's just one flight down. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I said, I, what, there's one thing I forgot to say. Uh, we put this together so quickly, we couldn't order books, which we like to do. And we always like to say at the IPK is that our goal is to provide all these events for free and to create great uh, programming. And what we like to do when we have a bookseller is to make sure the bookseller leaves here with no more books to carry home. That, that's not a problem tonight because there are no books. But I do want to say that this book has just come out. And it really is worth a read. And I hope you'll order it online or in your local bookstore. Thank you very much.